Okay, good morning. Um, so I want to talk about emotion and consciousness. I don't really work on consciousness. Um, I actually did my split brain PhD research on consciousness, which is how I got interested in emotion. But ever since, I've been trying to find ways of studying emotion without having to solve the mind-body problem. And uh, it keeps popping up, so this is my attempt, which I do it from time to time to come to terms with this. But I also want to kind of come to terms with the um, uh, general concept of emotion because I think that that has always been and continues to be and maybe will always be a problem in, in terms of what it means and what we're studying when we study it. Um, and one of the problems is we use the same word for a lot of different things. So we use it as the name of a research area, you know, I study emotion, or uh, we also use it to describe the conscious feelings that we have when we're uh, in, in some kind of emotional situation, like I feel afraid, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm anxious. Um, but we also use it to describe unconscious brain states that control uh, emotional responses and our feelings uh, in the presence of a so-called emotional stimulus. So we've got emotion as a noun, we've got emotion as an adjective, uh, and it's all over the place. You can see why these things get confusing because if you read a paper on emotion uh, in, in the literature these days, you often don't find anything about what they actually mean by the word emotion. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, the amygdala is active in the processing of emotional stimuli or emotional faces, something like that. But what, is it, what does emotion mean? So the, um, even when, when, the, when someone is, is doing research in this area and they state what their focus is, and this is something I've often done, which is state that I'm interested in how the brain detects and responds to threats. Um, when, when I give a lecture to an audience like this, whether it's to lay people or scientists, uh, they, the audience tends to gravitate towards the assumption that the research is really about how feelings come about, uh, how the brain makes feelings, feelings of fear. Um, because this is the standard definition of, of an emotion. It's a feeling. Here's some dictionary definitions. A feeling, a mental state that arises spontaneously rather than through conscious effort and often is accompanied by physiological changes, the part of consciousness that involves feelings. And that's why people, when you talk about emotion, tend to think you're talking about feelings. Um, now, research on emotion in animals is by necessity focused on responses things that you can measure. Uh, and by you know, the responses that are elicited by emotional stimuli, uh, and we often assume that these responses are a way of measuring feelings. I actually don't make that assumption, I think it's a bad idea. And the reason for that is that uh, because of two assumptions. One is that uh, emotional responses are a reliable indicator of feelings, and that the brain system that controls emotional responses also controls feelings. I think both of these are bad. Let's look at them. So uh, emotional responses are reliable indicator of feelings. So for example, we can uh, uh, put someone in a brain scanner, and I think Jorge will probably be telling us a little bit about this uh, in the next lecture, um, and we can elicit so-called fear responses or amygdala activity or, or um, uh, skin conductance responses or pupil dilation responses other kinds of physiological responses to a stimulus that is unconsciously processed. No indication that there's any conscious awareness of the stimulus. The person doesn't have any feeling, or doesn't report any feeling about the stimulus, and yet these so-called emotional responses are being elicited. So if you were using that as a measure of emotion, you would have to say that the emotion is unconscious, which Jorge will talk about non-conscious processing of emotion. But if we gravitate towards the idea of feeling, in a way, the idea of unconscious feeling doesn't make any sense. You can't have unconscious conscious states, I, I don't think. Uh, so um, that's one reason. People, um, um, you know, in general, the, 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 you can get emotional responses uh, that are controlled independent of any conscious feeling. There was a, a really interesting study done, I think it was a Canadian study done, I forget who it was done by, uh, but it was done in 20 or 30 years ago, where heroin addicts were uh, connected to an IV um, 
or maybe they were cocaine. I forget what kind of addiction they had, but they were, it was some sort of addiction. They were connected to an IV, and they were pressing a button not to get the drug. The drug was controlled by the experimenter, and the addict knew this. And the, their job was to simply press the button as a timekeeping thing. So they were pressing the button, and um, they were supposed to say when, the, when, the, when they felt the drug enter their system. So they're pressing the button, and at some point they say, okay, uh, I feel the drug now. But while they were pressing the button, their finger pressing had sped up long before, or measure, you know, measurably amount before uh, they actually reported any feeling of the, uh, the drug. So this, and, you know, there are many, many examples that we could go through here where feelings are not necessarily um, uh, reliably coupled to behavioral responses uh, that, that tend to go with those feelings or that we use as measures of those feelings. So what about the second assumption? The brain system that controls emotional responses also controls feelings. So this is a core concept in so-called basic emotions theory. Uh, basic emotions theory assumes that there's a certain set of core emotions like fear and anger and uh, uh, joy and, and so on that are hardwired in the brain that are, have been put in the brain by evolution because of the survival value of the feeling associated with those emotions, um, and that we can, um, and that have hardwired responses connected with them. So we can use those responses to go and determine what parts of the brain are involved in controlling the responses, and then know where the feeling comes from. So this is uh, this, this particular line of thought is particularly characteristic of uh, uh, someone like Panksepp who has a number of emotion systems in animal brains, the hardwired basic emotion systems in animal brains, where the system that is controlling the behavioral response is responsible for the feeling. So this is a kind of uh, a, a general schematic of what one of these basic emotion systems looks like. They call these things affective, affect programs. Uh, and what the, some of the evidence that's most often used uh, for this is research on the amygdala and fear with, that I've done or other colleagues uh, uh, in the field have done that, that um, uh, support the idea that the amygdala is very important in detecting threatening stimuli and controlling uh, protective responses, hardwired protective responses in the presence of those stimuli. So uh, the view that people assume that I have, because I'm often associated with this basic emotions point of view, is that the amygdala, I think the amygdala is also responsible for fearful feelings. I don't think that's the case. Uh, so this is my, the view of my thoughts as seen by others. Uh, and this is more like what I have actually worked on. So we've identified connections from the thalamus and the sensory cortex that uh, connect to the amygdala and allow the control of specific responses, such as behavioral responses, like freezing behavior in a rat, autonomic responses, endocrine responses, uh, controlled by different brainstem areas for each of those kinds of responses, as outputs of specific amygdala areas. And there's a lot of detail within the amygdala that I've left out. There is no the amygdala. There's a lot of different parts, each of which do different things in different kinds of behavioral situations. But this is kind of the basic empirical foundation of what I've done. And when I've talked about feelings, I've talked about it as you know, a product of some kind of workspace, whether it's cortical, it might include subcortical. Um, doesn't necessarily imply executive function, but just some kind of integrative uh, uh, system where information about the immediately present stimulus uh, is interacting with memories, both episodic and semantic memories about um, uh, things that might have happened in the past. So let's say there's a snake on the path, so you have episodic memories about experiences you've had with snakes. You have semantic memories about the kinds of uh, snakes that are dangerous and that snakes may be poisonous and uh, things like that. Um, combined with the fact that the amygdala is active and in sending inputs to these cortical areas, uh, but the amygdala is also leading to arousal in the brainstem, and that's uh, entering, contributing to this workspace processing as well and you have feedback from bodily responses. So this is what the, I mean, the conscious experience of fear, in my opinion, is 
some kind of integration of all these things going on. Uh, I don't think we know exactly where that goes on, uh, and that's an important question, in the, I think, in the study of consciousness, but that's not really what my work has been about. So the mistake I've made over the years is to call this thing that the amygdala has been doing in the control of all these responses a fear circuit. Uh, because that automatically takes you down the path to fearful feelings. And by confusing these two meanings of fear, a brain system that controls responses in the presence of threatening stimuli, and a brain system that experiences fear, I think that I've done the field a disservice. So here's my confession. Um, and so a couple of months ago, I published this uh, rather long article in Neuron where I kind of laid out a different view of things uh, that, that tries to... Um, uh, come to terms with all of this. And part of why I was uh, moved to do this was because not only was I uncomfortable with the, uh, the way that my work had been interpreted as part of a basic emotion system and as a source of feelings and the feelings of fear in the brain, uh, but also I've, you know, I've been involved in a lot of work with uh, colleagues who do invertebrate uh, research. And I know there'll be a talk later by David Edelman on, on invertebrates. Um, and, but that's always kind of pushed the, the, uh, the limits to, of feelings too much, I think, if we're going into invertebrates, but you know, we'll see what David has to say. Um, but also, I came across some research on, uh, on single-cell organisms that, by all practical purposes, if you use the same criteria that we use in rats, you would have to say that they have fearful feelings. So let's, uh, let's go through some of this. So emotions become a very popular topic in, uh, in neuroscience and psychology. This is just a you know, standard kind of thing you'll see where you go into the literature and see how many hits you get in different decades, and it's really jumped up in the last decade. Um, but as I said earlier, the, what, what people mean by emotion is not often described in, in these uh, papers. Um, in fact, there's a little consensus in psychology or neuroscience about what emotion is and how it differs from other aspects of mind and behavior. A uh, famous quote is everyone knows what emotion is until they're asked to define it, and if we went around the room, you'd all have different uh, points of view. So how can we study emotion in the brain, especially in the brains of animals, if we don't know what it is that we're talking about? So basically, we fake it. So how do we do that? Well, we start with introspection. We say introspection tells us that uh, some mental states have a kind of feeling associated with them and others don't, and those states that have feelings associated, and we call those emotions. So, um, and we use these terms interchangeably often. So we have words like fear, anger, love, jealousy for these feeling states, and then we use these feeling words, especially English words, as a guidepost to go looking for our brain systems that make the feelings described by those words. So we're starting with a lot of high-level stuff, like words, have a lot of baggage associated with them that we collapse into a single meaning and think that that's going to tell us something about the brain, which I think is, you know, I've done this for years, but I think it's a bad idea. So here are some of the, uh, the words um, that come out of subjective experience. I mean, some of these are basic emotions, others, uh, jealousy, pride, and so forth, or, or higher order emotions. Um, I'm mainly going to be focusing on the, the basic emotions idea today, though. So here are the list of sta standard list of basic emotions. I think these are Ekman's. Uh, uh, each of these is said to be generated by an innate circuit uh, that is uh, conserved across mammals. And you know the wisdom of using these feeling words as a way to go looking for things in the human brain um, has been questioned by a lot of people. Just a few examples listed here. But whatever problems there are with this in, in humans, they're greatly confounded and multiplied in, uh, uh, when we try to use this to study emotions in animals. So, can we really do this? Can we find these basic emotions in animals? So here's a, a rat and a cat. They, I guess they're experiencing something, but I think whatever they're experiencing probably has little to do with what a, a human would call fear <laughs> or happiness or joy, or whatever the cat might be experiencing. Again, you know, these words are concepts. They're not things. They're just concepts of a lot of stuff, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, you know, I have a cat. I, pr I pet him. He purrs. I think he feels something, but I, you know, it's not going to be what I think of as pleasure or joy, 
because my brain is very different from my cat's brain in a lot of ways. Similar in a way, a lot of ways too. So how do, what do we do? How do we get past all of this? Um, I think one of the things we have to do is separate the phenomena of interest from the overarching concept of emotion. So, you know, there are things, I think there are definitely things that are shared by humans and other animals that are relevant to the topic of emotion. Uh, but, I, but I really believe that human subjective experience is the wrong way to get at these. So how do we separate these things? So what are the key phenomena? That's the first question to ask. So we, let's say we look at uh, responses to threats, tasty food and drink, potential mates, and other situations in which survival or, or well-being is uh, challenged or enhanced. And we have a pretty good list of the you know, if we start with this, we have a pretty good kind of uh, uh, space uh, that covers a lot of the things that you study when you study emotions in animals. So if we put this in terms of, uh, of brain systems, we have systems for defense, energy, nutrition, management, fluid balance, thermoregulation, reproduction. Uh, I'm not trying to reproduce basic emotions here. Uh, I'm just trying to list some things that are in that, that when you study an animal um, and you're studying so-called emotion, you're, these are the systems that you're engaging, really. Uh, defense systems, detection of threats, for example. Energy nutrition, you have an animal pressing a bar to get uh, food or cocaine or morphine. It's, you're dealing with food or water, you're dealing with the energy and nutrition system. Um, you, it might be pressing the bar to get food, to get water. Uh, you're dealing with the fluid balance system. Uh, animals also do things uh, to um, um, warm themselves if they're cold. People will do the same thing. You're outside and it's freezing cold. You come into a building, it feels good. Um, and reproduction, of course, sex is a, a major source of uh, so-called pleasure feelings. Um, but again, I'm not trying to reproduce the, the basic emotions here. I'm just trying to look at some things that are necessary uh, that, that kind of define a space in which animal research is done. Um, these are what we might call survival phenomena, and they're closely associated with emotion, but they'd be of interest even if we never had words like emotion and feelings. The things that keep animals alive are really what drives a lot of people into research on animals to figure out how you know, the animal uh, is adapted to its environment and how, how it's responding in challenging or uh, situations where, where good things are going to happen. Um, I think they're very important for emotion, but they're not emotional phenomena. So let me just stop for a second and talk about survival. I mean, hasn't this always been a key part of uh, research on animals? So Darwin had this famous book, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. Uh, the limbic system theory was all about uh, uh, survival and, and how the limbic system allowed animals to uh, adapt and survive. Uh, modern basic emotions theory, I've already talked about that. Damasio has a version of basic emotions. Um, so certainly lots of people have talked about emotion and survival. Um, but in all of these points of view, what you see is uh, claims like uh, things that the, the animals have some emotions, feelings, that are homologous with human emotions and that are conserved, that are, that are conserved circuit that makes the, make these feelings possible. So the reason that you have a system um, for uh, the reason animals do things and repeat things, for example, in reward-based learning, according to a standard view, would be because of the pleasure that they get from obtaining the reward. But you know, even Thorndike uh, uh, had to reject this when he came up with the law of effect. So he started out with the idea that the law of effect was a pleasure principle, but it eventually gravitated towards the idea, uh, of course behaviorism was coming along at that point, that um, what animals are doing is maximizing their behavioral opportunities. So, um, you know, I think behaviorism gets a bad rap these days. Um, it uh, it provide, we almost all of the research we do is based on behaviorism, all of the techniques, especially in animals, but even human research methodology, uh, cognitive, the co methodology of cognitive science, was constrained by the basic methods that the uh, uh, behaviorists came up with. So I've often been, not often, but sometimes been characterized as a behavior, radical behaviorist uh, disguised as a neuroscientist. 
Uh, but that's not really true because I think consciousness exists. I believe it's important. Um, I just think that we have to understand when we're studying consciousness and when we're not. And that's often not the case in the field of emotion. So I think the, this point of view where feelings are the driving force of behavior uh, and that we can use behavior to find feeling systems in the brain really puts the cart before the horse in evolutionary, ter in evolutionary terms. So it, it frames the question in an unnatural direction. So it's looking backwards and anthropomorphically into evolutionary history by asking you know, where, whether human emotions, feelings have counterparts in animals and when what we should be asking is uh, to what extent are functions and circuits that are present in other animals are they also present in, uh, in humans? And if so, what do they contribute to our brains? So there are conserved circuits, but they're not feeling circuits. They're these survival circuits. So let's take fear, for example. Uh, fear is a natural thing that we associate with uh, the defense system. Uh, it's a product of uh, this defense circuit in the presence of innate or learned threats. But it can also arise in relation to a lot of other systems. So you can be afraid of starving or of dehydrating, of freezing to death, but never having sex again. Uh, you can have all kinds of fears, existential fears, fears of dying, uh, fears of, uh, you know, you can imagine all sorts of things that you can be afraid of, alien abduction. Um, so it's not all about predatory defense, which is what the amygdala system is particularly uh, good for. So automatically, we've got a thing we call the fear system, you know, the amygdala circuitry, which doesn't take care of most of the kinds of fears we experience. So um, these are some of the uh, things that, you know, that I've struggled with and trying to come to terms with, even though I've you know, been one of the main proponents of the amygdala and fear. What about pleasure, joy, happiness, reinforcement? So you can get pleasure from food, from uh, drink, from uh, being warm when it's cold, from sex, and so forth. Again, there's no pleasure system. We often talk about reward with, you know, in quotes, the reward system of the brain, uh, reward prediction error in the, in the stride and dopamine signaling. That may be a final common path for some kind of reward, but what, what is the basis of a, reward, of a reward? If you think about a rat pressing a bar in the presence of the tome that's predicting food and you have a dopamine prediction error model um, in the striatum, you know, computational model that explains that, why is the rat pressing the bar when the tome comes on? Because the tome predicts food. So you've got to tie the reinforcement ultimately back to the, the uh, regulatory system that makes the thing reinforcing. What about, uh, you know, you could, you could have the same thing for pressing the bar for liquid, for warmth, for sexual uh, opportunity for sex, and so forth. So reinforcement is not some, you know, ghostly thing out there. It's tied to specific regulatory systems uh, in many cases, and we need to come back to this. I mean, even people like Paul Glemsher and Wolfram Schultz are now talking about the motivational specificity of reward. So... Uh, I think we have to come back to the biological roots of things. We get stuck in the psychological or you know, conceptual space sometimes and lose track of exactly what those concepts mean when we're actually studying the brain. Because you can use a word, you can call anything you want in the brain by a word, but you know, what does that word really mean in terms of neural processes and how the brain is doing what it's doing? So all animals have the ability to solve these problems, move away from harm, move towards nutrients, balance fluids and electrolytes, thermoregulate and reproduce. But also single cells do. So here's bacteria living in a petri dish in the lab and on the top they're just dis dispersed, you squirt acid in the petri dish, they all move to one side. People in a swimming pool put acid in, they all move to one side. So are the bacteria afraid of the acid and if not are people afraid of the acid probably people are afraid when they find out there's acid in there but if they start feeling something burning they're going to start to move away from it before they know it's acid we part of life is being able to detect and respond to danger whether you're a single cell organism or a human 
Now, there are lots of differences between bacteria and humans. I don't deny that. But we have to understand the origins of things in the broadest possible sense. Otherwise, we start, if we start with mammals and try to explain everything there, we lose the entire biological history of why mammals do things. So, you know, as I said, lots of difference between bacteria and people. Uh, you know, we've got an evolutionary history that takes you from single cells to multicellular collections and to multicellular uh, uh, organisms that have multiple systems. In other words, animals, uh, which a group called metazoa. And if we look at the kind of the history of metazoa, you see where you know all different things sort of expand out from from single cellular organisms. Uh, but if we just focus on animals now for a while, animals are organisms with multiple systems, and these systems are controlled by the nervous system. In fact, the nervous system evolved to regulate these systems, to keep animals alive. Um, so you, the nervous system didn't evolve to uh, make a, an aplesia want to close its gill when it feels afraid of something coming in. It didn't even evolve to do, the, to, uh, do those complex things. So the ability to detect danger was present before invertebrates existed. When you get into a multicellular organism, you still have to do those kinds of things, detect danger, balance your fluids, uh, and so forth. But you have different ways of doing it because things get more complex. Uh, now, invertebrates have lots of different nervous systems. Uh, they solve these problems in lots of different ways. Vertebrates have a kind of standardized nervous system that has all the main parts, hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain, conserved circuits in each of those segments all the way through evolutionary history of vertebrates. By the way, the, the vertebrate uh, uh, chain, the vertebrate lineage here goes back it appears to the, the, the animal most relevant to our evolutionary history seems to be something like a starfish. Um, there's a, a long, interesting story about that in terms of the um, uh, direction in which the mouth versus the anus develops, um, uh, the, the, the uh, trajectory, which one develops first in, in infancy. Uh, and humans, like the starfish line, the anus develops first. I know there's a late night joke uh, for a TV show there somewhere. But, um, the, um, if we look at the, the vertebrate brain, though, that as we go through, there are these conserved circuits. For example, here's the uh, uh, system involved in managing energy and nutrition. This is highly conserved throughout mammals, other vertebrates. Many of the hormones that, that take care of these things are conserved. The, uh, the neural circuit is highly uh, regulated and conserved, hypothalamic mechanisms, pituitary, all of that stuff. Sexual behavior, same way. This is the, uh, the defense system that we've studied uh, for so long. We've expanded it from the basic amygdala circuitry, controlling these automatic reactions like freezing behavior, autonomic responses, and hormonal responses into the guidance of instrumental behavior or goal-directed actions uh, where animals are learning to uh, use a tone that's paired with shock, not just to elicit fear, so-called fear responses like freezing, but also to guide behaviors that allow them to uh, prevent the shock from coming when the tone comes on and so forth. So this is the, the broader circuitry that, that we're dealing with. Uh, and again, this is highly conserved through mammals and to the extent that it's been studied, it's been found in other vertebrates like uh, reptiles and so forth, at least parts of it. Now, but all of my work is focused on conditioned fear. I've become impressed over the last few years of all the work that's being done on unconditioned fear. And it's been puzzling how it doesn't line up with what we've called the fear system from studies of conditioned fear. So on the right is the so-called conditioned fear circuitry. Threat, auditory system, lateral amygdala, central amygdala, also connections within amygdala circuits, down to the ventral part of the PAG. But if you look at the circuitry for um, unconditioned threats, on the far side, you have uh, odor cues, or like predator odor cues. These don't go through the lateral and central amygdala. Uh, they go through 
and they skip everything except the medial amygdala because that gets the vermeral nasal inputs and they go to the hypothalamus, the intermedial hypothalamus and the, the um, uh, premammillary nucleus of the hypothalamus and then the dorsal PAG. So it's not the same. And if, you, if, you, if the threat is through, unconditioned threat is through auditory or visual uh, inputs, you get some overlap like the lateral amygdala is involved, but the rest is different. So it's just not the same circuitry. Um, so we can't say that there's a fear circuitry because even innate and learned fear in, in a very similar context uh, don't have the same circuitry. So you know, I've concluded that there's no fear system in the brain. There are innate circuits that underlie innate and learned fear responses. Uh, but feelings of fear can arise from a lot of different uh, survival circuits. As I said earlier, uh, fear of predator, uh, fear of, of, um, uh, of a, a learned stimulus that predicts harm, like a painful stimulus, a, a cue that predicts pain. You could have fear of starving, fear of dehydrating, fear of hypothermia and so forth. But also, independent of any survival circuit, feeling the fear of falling in love, the fear of death, the fear of fear itself. So there's no little spot in the brain that is generating these feelings of fear across all these examples here. Fear is an experience, a conscious experience, that the brain can come up with in a variety of ways. And you know, in a way, it's again, we get back to the concept. We have this concept of fear. There are 37 different words in English that have to do with fear and anxiety and so forth. So it's a very big semantic space that we've been like crunching down into a very small uh, space for a long time. I think we need to give up on the idea that our, these words like fear and so forth mean something in terms of uh, circuitry. These are experiences. What we have are circuits that keep animals alive. So these circuits are in, in invertebrates are um, uh, not the same, uh, but there are, but there's a still a lot of conservation even, there's even conservation in plants of uh, things that are important in, in uh, various uh, vertebrate and ma mammalian behavior. Uh, for example, they have in plants have NMDA receptors, they have serotonin transporter genes. Um, so the building blocks, this is all about building blocks. The building blocks for all the things that we talk about in behavior present in single cell organisms all the way through uh, humans, but also in Divergent groups, plants, have some of these building blocks. Plants can detect harm and move away from it in some cases. If you look at the circuitry in the plesia, the molecules involved in fear conditioning in aplesia are identical in many respects to the molecules involved in, in mammals, in rats and mice. Uh, so the circuitry is somewhat different, but each animal has a different kind of circuitry to solve the problem. Once you get into vertebrates, the circuitry is the same, but the molecules that were present in invertebrates where this problem was solved long ago because we have no aplesia in our evolutionary history, so there's got to be convergence way, way back about how learning occurs uh, that, that makes these things conserved. Okay, so I'm running out of time. Um, I just, this kind of puts it all together in terms of uh, what these survival circuits do. I just want to pinpoint a couple of things. One, it's been one of these survival circuits are active up there on the left. Others are inhibited. Uh, so when you're in danger, you don't uh, go looking for sex or um, uh, other things uh, because there's interactions between these things and one rises in priority and the other is lower in priority. Um, you don't go looking for food. But you know, if you're starving to death, you have to take the risk of going out into a, a dangerous environment and get something to eat. So the, the energy nutrition system is going to rise in priority and the defense system is going to go down a little bit. So I, I sort of described all this already, where all these things kind of are integrated. Uh, and I think what this does is creates a global organismic state. Um, we don't have to call that a feeling. In fact, I think a feeling is more than, than the global organismic state. Uh, these global organismic states are survival circuit specific. So uh, if in danger, you have a different kind of global organismic state than you have when you're uh, hungry. Um, but I don't think that these states themselves, this was sometimes called a motive state in the older literature. Um, I think Bendra here from McGill was, uh, had, had this idea. And, but they're not enough uh, for 
a feeling. I think a feeling has to be witnessed or otherwise experienced. And in order for that to happen, you have to have a brain that's capable of witnessing its own activity, its own state. So I'm not going to tell you what consciousness is or what a feeling is, but I hope I've outlined some of the um, uh, parameters uh, that, that may be underlying a lot of things we call feelings. And I hope I've changed your mind a little bit about what fear is and what emotions are in the brains, especially in the brains of animals. Okay, thank you.